Good day, everyone. Welcome back to our show. I pray that God will give us wisdom once again to have a productive learning experience here at Vet Talks with Doc Athena. Good morning. Today we are going to discuss internal parasites of ruminants focusing on fecal egg worms. This is a guide for animal raisers, students of veterinary medicine and animal science, and basically anyone who is interested in this topic. Here is a photo from researchgate.net showing us the fecal eggs under the microscope. The fecal eggs presented on this photo are called strongyle type eggs. This strongyle type are thin, smooth shell containing anything from eight cells to larvae. So again, we will be focusing on the fecal worm eggs of internal parasites of ruminants. There will be five internal parasites of ruminants that we will be discussing. And I would like to thank our source of photos for this particular lecture. Intervet, thank you for this images, a guide to internal parasites of ruminants, including their relative sizes. However, of course, it depends on the microscope that you're using, but for an ordinary light microscope, you might see the one that I showed you a while ago. But there are some characteristics of some eggs that will indicate or that will tell us what type of egg is it and from which parasite it came from. Later, we will discuss this. But for now, let me give you an overview. So we will be discussing roundworms or nematodes flukes or flatworms, also called as trematodes, tapeworms, also called as cestodes, and also lungworms and coccygia. For this lecture, part 2 of Internal Parasites of Ruminants, we will be discussing about tapeworms or cestodes, lungworms, and coccygia. Tapeworms or cestodes Tapeworms have thick shelled eggs and they have segments called proglottids which can be often seen in manure but are not considered harmful. It depends on the worm load but most of the time it is not harmful because it is relatively non-pathogenic but Heavy infections can still result in mild unthriftiness and gastrointestinal disturbances. We have a photo here of cestode and as you can see as presented in the photo, there is a pyriform apparatus and an embryo. So I would like to thank our source, thank you RVC, for these photos. The most common tapeworms are the monieza. They are segmented fleshy tapeworm and transmitted by free-living pasture grass mites and is found in the intestinal tract. But in spite of its large size, is probably of little consequence. You can see the images of monieza fecal egg worms from Intervet, and there are two types of monieza that has been reported. First is the monieza expansa, which mainly affects sheep and has triangular to pyramidal eggs with the size of 50 to 60 micrometers. And you can see that on the right side. Next is the monieza benedini, which mainly affects cattle and it has quadrangular eggs with a size of 80 to 90 micrometers. You can see the photo on the right side as well. Another tapeworm that is reported is the Tysanosoma actinoides or the fringed tapeworm and it can be found 
in the small intestine, bile ducts, and pancreatic ducts. And these tapeworms, as mentioned, may not cause clinical disease, but it is of economic importance due to condemnation of the organ if the parasite is present. There may be no clinical disease that is going on or that might affect the animal, but condemnation of the organs has economic impact on the farmer. Okay, so that is for tapeworms or cestodes. Just a short break, Fox. Did you learn something so far? If yes, please give us a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, clarifications, or anything related to this lecture video, please comment it below. Are you enjoying this free lecture? If yes, please consider subscribing in our YouTube channel and follow us on Doc Athena Facebook page because through the page, we could communicate better. I do my best to reply to all your comments here in YouTube, but if you want a better communication, then please do follow our Facebook page so that we can have a better form of communication. That's for a short break. Now let's go back to work. Now let's talk about lungworms, which parasitize the respiratory tract. Those in the upper airways cause nasal discharge, and the mucus buildup and inflammation cause coughing, emphysema, and dyspnea. The irritation caused by lungworms in the bronchioles inside the lung causes local reaction with mucus and white blood cells, or the phlegm that are trying to get rid of the parasites. The reported types of lungworms in ruminants include Dictyocaulus viviparus or Mullerus capillaris. Next is Coxigia. Coxigia is a protozoan that causes coxigosis and it could be Imeria or Isospora. If in ruminants, the roundworms are categorized based on their location, stomach worm, small intestinal worm, or large intestinal worm, Imeria in birds are also categorized based on their predilection site. Coxigia infect the interior of cells lining the lymphatic blood vessels, or called as lacteals in the distal small intestine or ileum. Later in their life cycle, they also infect the cells lining the ileum, cecum, and proximal portion of the colon, which is already part of the large intestine, destroying the crypts that the animals need to absorb nutrients. Therefore, the most common sign of oxygen infection is diarrhea which is usually detected by dirty hind ends and failure to thrive or weight loss. So that's it for the internal parasites of ruminants. For references, I would like to thank Claire and Darasen and Troy Brick, Robert Corwin and Richard Rental, as well as Mark Fox, Shane Gadberry et al., John Gillard, and Aurora Villarreal. Thank you very much for sharing all the information from your outputs. For summary, these are the most common internal parasites of ruminants, the roundworms or nematodes, flukes or flatworms, and also called as trematodes, tapeworms also called as cestodes, the lungworms, and coxigia. Internal worm infections usually cause battle jaw, especially with stomach worms and liver flukes. So this is a condition where animals have fluctuant swelling under the jaw from the accumulation of fluid or also known as submandibular edema. So sometimes it can spread to under the abdomen. And it is very important that before you give the wormers, please do conduct or please do submit fecal eggs for fecalysis 
because there's no dewormer that could kill all the worms. So, for example, if what they saw in the lab are tapeworms, the vet would probably prescribe praziquantel, or there are other dewormers that might be more effective on certain parasitic load of your animals. That's why fecalysis is very important, especially in considering the effectivity of certain drugs. Also, when you do the worming, please ask your veterinarian for rotation of the wormers to prevent anthelmintic resistance in your herd or in your farm. So that's it for the discussion of our internal parasites of ruminants focusing on the fecal egg worms. That's all, folks. I hope you learned something from this lecture video. Thank you very much. Please take care, everyone. God bless us all, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye! Thank you for being with us in this episode of Vet Talks with Doc Athena. For those who have not yet subscribed our YouTube channel, please do so. Did you learn something from this lecture? If yes, please hit the like button. If you want to be a part of our social media community and always updated of our new posts or to talk to me directly, you may do so by following our Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. Again, thank you very much. Please keep safe, everyone. God bless us all, and I hope to see you again in our next lecture. This is Doc Athena, your country vet.